So if everybody's ready, I think we can get this thing started. Good evening to all. Goedenavond iedereen. Welkom op de Douglas Ling uh, online degustatie vanavond, masterclass. Uh, Dale will be uh, providing us with some additional information on six lovely bottles we will be trying tonight. Um, as already said in the chat by Walter, there are two top bottlings uh, in there. That's uh, absolute, absolutely true, Walter. There's a Scallywag and there's a Timorous Beastie for you. So uh, <laughs> there's uh, absolutely wonderful stuff to try. Um, I would like to welcome Stefan as well and Dirk, uh, who will be uh, help, assisting me in uh, providing some additional information. But of course, well, let's give the mic to Dale now. And well, Dale, the floor is yours. Uh, go right ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawyers, as always. Good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's lovely to see all your faces. Thank you for taking the time uh, to, to join us on a, on a Tuesday evening for a few drams. Hopefully it's better than the, the Tuesday evening you would have otherwise had planned. Um, as Chris suggests, my, uh, my goal tonight is to, to make sure you guys have a good time and enjoy a few nice whiskeys. Um, so, of course, fire in some questions into the chat uh, and Chris will, will help field them. Um, but obviously, um, you know, I want you guys to relax, enjoy the whiskies, um, and and let us know if you if you need any other information from me. So I'm coming to you live from Glasgow, uh, from the Douglas Lang offices, um, and I think uh, we're going to crack on with the first whiskey straight away, um, because I hate doing a tasting and talking for 15 minutes before anyone gets a chance to try something. So. If everyone can please locate their first whiskey, because it's already been about seven minutes longer than I would like for us to have our first whiskey. <laughs> so if you guys give that a pour into your glass, you should see a kind of stunning, deep, rich, sherry, amber color in your glass. And first thing I want you to do is give it a swirl. Get some oxygen into it and then get your nose on it. And hopefully you guys will smell immediately those big kind of dark spices, dark fruits um, from, uh, that we get from that amazing kind of sherry cask. What this is, is a, a, a alternative for our usual kind of scallywag. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the product in a minute, but let's all have a wee sip first and then I can tell you about the whiskey. So for the first time this evening, everyone, Slangevar. Cheers. Lunch. Yummy. So this is, uh, hopefully everyone gets a sort of similar flavors here, which is that's kind of dark Spanish sherry, spicy, fruity, um, amazing kind of traditional space side flavors. So this whiskey is quite special really because it's, a, it's an amazing place to start. Um, because this is the Scallywag Dinon limited edition. So Scallywag, most of you will hopefully know, um, is our Speyside blended malt. So it's a marriage of Macallan, Mortlock and Glenrothes, all married together and aged in sherry casks for the majority of its life. Um, and the idea behind it is that we, we encapsulate the ultimate kind of taste of Speyside. This particular edition um, was created with us and Sunoco, um, to, to come up with this really cool label and to give Belgium something obviously personalised to them. We've increased the ABV to 48% and we've obviously uh, tweaked the recipe a little bit so that um, we give you guys something unique. Uh, so hopefully everyone agrees that this is a really interesting kind of variety of the traditional scallywag. I think for me, you get a little bit more of those kind of dark, spicy, fruity flavours. It, it's got a little bit um, more sherry influence in my opinion. And then you get that little bit of higher ABV, which gives it a, a bit more of a kick. Um, so this for us was a really fun one to work on. It's a, it's a great example of kind of something we can do as a, as a kind of independent family owned business, which is we can create these limited edition special market exclusives for, you know, our, our fans in Belgium and, and do it in partnership with, uh, with Sunoco to create this kind of interesting label and, and release. So I think I saw in the chat there some, some flavor descriptions, dark chocolate and vanilla, 100%. So those big vanilla flavors come through from the, the kind of bourbon cast that we use, 
And then you get those dark fruits, which for me is the dominant flavor, that kind of dark fruit and spice that we get from the sherry. So I'm hoping everyone is getting the similar tasting notes to me. Are you guys? Oh. I'm willing uh, to. You're uh, I was, sorry, uh, I, was, I was thinking, uh, you said you've upped the uh, ABV a bit, up to, uh, to 48%. Yes. What, what was the main reason uh, for that? Um, because I, I really like the, the, the flavors are a bit more intense than a regular uh, scallywag for me. Yeah, that, and that's, that's kind of, to be honest with you, you've kind of answered the question there in the sense that when we release a, a limited edition or a market exclusive or something like that, we want to give it a point of difference. So quite often that will come in the form of ABV so we can have a, a play around with the ABV, but it's not just a case of, you know, it's not like we pour ethanol into a bottle until it changes. We, we will taste the sample at different strengths until we think we've hit something that, that's really quite special. So we know that we have some scallywag, um, we have some scallywag variations that are 48% and the liquid seems to, to cope really well with that slightly higher alcohol. Um, I think the fact that this is a little bit more specialist as well means that we can afford to, to experiment a little higher with the alcohol. So the chances are that the people who are getting their hands on this whiskey are probably a little bit more regular seasoned whiskey drinkers. Um, so it means that we can afford to push the liquid a little bit further. Um, and hopefully people agree that the bigger flavor, the slightly bigger flavor that you get at 48% um, works really well. The reason that the main products maybe not at 48% is because having it at 46 just makes it a little bit more accessible. Um, so something a little bit more specialist like this, I think we can justify the, the slightly higher ABV. Well, it's, it really well uh, succeeded uh, in this, for, for, the, for this scally work, to be honest. Is there actually uh, an ID you get uh, before you start blending for a specific limited edition? Is there in advance uh, an ID that you say it has to be this kind of flavor or do you just start blending and then look where you can get to? It depends. Some, so it's a bit of a, it can be a bit chicken and egg. Um, so sometimes we start with the spirit. We, we, you know, we, we're constantly experimenting with, with spirit and different ABVs and different finishes. So sometimes we will do something and we'll say, that's amazing. Um, and then we come up with the concept later um, for how we can release it as a limited edition. Sometimes the concept will come first. So sometimes... You know, this one, uh, Stefan and, and Glenn at Sunoco came to me and said, um, you know, I think we could do something really cool with Scallywag. I think it's um, it's got a good following in, in Belgium and, and I think there is a market and people that would be interested in, in something that's a bit more specialist for Belgium. Um, so in this instance, we came up with the idea first and then I called our production team and, and gave them a headache and told them we needed something, um, something a little bit higher ABV, something that was great liquid and big sherry influence. Um, so they, they've come up with this, which I think is a, is a big success. Yep. And just Any questions in the chat or is somebody who would like to add some comments to that or some flavor, uh, please pass them on. So from what do you buy a lot of spirit at Douglas Ling or do you only buy matured whiskey? Great question. Um, so the answer is it's a combination, um, but more and more and more, we are starting to buy new make spirit. So it used to be a combination of, of the two. I think now probably 90 to 95% of the time, um, we'll buy the new make spirit and we'll age it in our own wood that we source. Um, that's our preference because our field of expertise is wood. Um, we, we can have a massive influence on, on the aging of the whiskey. Um, about 70% of the flavor comes from the wood. So if we can have more control of that, it allows us to, um, to kind of dictate the, the spirit a little bit more. So the answer is we do a little bit of both, but the ma vast majority now of what we do is new make spirit that we age in our own wood. Right. It's, it's more fun that way as well, Chris. Absolutely, absolutely. There's always a bit of a surprise to what you're gonna get. So it's like a box of chocolates. You never know yeah, what you're gonna I, get. Absolutely, absolutely. A, and just an additional, additional question here. Yeah. Do you have a preferred oh, yeah. place to buy spirit from? Well, I, I suppose uh, Portellum isn't, isn't any longer <laughs> living spirit at the yeah. moment. But. Uh, 
is there a preferred distilleries? I mean, yes, there will be. There will be some distilleries that, that we think, you know, their, their spirit works particularly well in certain types of wood that we buy. Um, and maybe some, some distilleries have particularly good uh, new make spirit that we can play around with and it'll be a bit more adaptable. But the, the kind of true answer is that um, every distillery we, we work with produces amazing spirit. It will just, it's the variety that we find interesting. So as an independent bottler, we are not confined to a region or to a, just one type of um, spirit or one certain level of cut or anything like that. We, we have the luxury to, to pick and choose from around 60 distilleries over Scotland um, and we can release them at different ages, different strengths, different cask finishes. So there will be some distilleries we work with more than others, um, either, but either for business reasons or for, for spirit reasons. Um, but the truth of the matter is that the biggest benefit to what we do is the variety that we can, we can come up with from all different regions and different spirit types. Well, in addition to that, um, I have noticed that several independent bottlers, all independent bottler has a few distilleries in which they release some amazing bottles and they usually come from the same distilleries. I've had a similar experience with Douglas Lang. For instance, for me personally, I always love when you bottle an Ocantoshan. There's always all the Ocantoshans I've tried so far from Douglas Lang, whether it be in provenance up to XOPs, they're all amazing uh, bottlings. But Douglas Ling is the only one that delivers always an amazing Ocantoshan. So what's, do you have any idea what the reason for that is? Well, we're just very good at what we do, Chris. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, look, uh, uh, well, one of the answers is genuinely, you know, we've, we've got a lot of experience in this field. So we've been doing it for 73 years. Um, and, and our owner, Fred, will, will taste a lot of these casks and, and has an extremely good palate. So our job is to judge when the, the cask peaks. Um, and the, maybe the reason, I mean, Ockentosh and famously make excellent spirit and they have a really unique way of distilling spirit. So for us, it's just about respecting that spirit and finding the good wood. So we, I think the answer is probably it's a combination of, of having the skill to do it and having the, the contracts to get the best wood. So we, because we buy so many casks um, and because we have such good relationship with cask suppliers, it means that we get access to, the, to some of the best casks in the world. And that is really, I mean, that's, it almost makes it sound easy what we do. If you get fantastic spirit and you put it in great casks, then a single, releasing a single cask is just a waiting game. You, you, you try it and you try it and you try it until you think it's, it's never gonna get any better. Um, and then we'll release it. So very simply speaking, if we get great spirit and great wood, our job after that can be quite easy. You just have to be patient and, and willing to, and, and you have to have knowledge of when, uh, when to judge a liquid at its best, I guess. Well, it depends on what you call easy, of course, being patient with whiskey. You have a good <laughs> yeah, it's the hardest <laughs> job of all. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just listen, while, while we're trying the Scallywag, I, I know we're, we're probably ready for the next dram soon, but I just want to yep. tell you a little bit about, I know you, I'm not sure if you've still got the slides up, Chris, I'm not sure if I've got the, the same view, yep. but um, I just want to tell you a little bit about, so Scallywag itself, obviously, I've told you a little bit about, that's our, our space side blended malt, um, and if that, thanks Chris, that's perfect. And I think something important to, to tell you about Scallywag is this is one of our remarkable regional malts and it comes from a category called blended malt. So obviously part of tonight, you know, 50% of tonight we'll be talking about single casks and we'll be talking about Asian casks. But the first bit of this tasting is really focusing on this amazing category of blended malts. So I said to you before that um, the process of creating single casks is, you know, it's not easy. You need experience, you need good contacts, you need good spirit and good wood. But relatively speaking, it's quite straightforward. It's a case of getting fantastic quality and judging when it's ready and then knowing when to release it, what strength and, and all of that's a skill. But it's not it's nothing compared to the skill of creating blended malts. So creating a blended malt is, is an art form of marrying together different products with different attributes to create something that is better than the sum of its parts. So we always say at Douglas Lang, if a, if a single malt is like a well-played violin, then a good blended malt can be like a, an orchestra in perfect harmony. And that's really how we view it. Um, it's, it's, it's not saying that it's better than single malt. It's not saying that single malt's better than blended malt. It's simply a case of 
both have their attributes, both are, are have different skill sets to make them, um, but both deserve a massive, massive amount of respect and, and attention because um, they're both can be phenomenal. I've tasted lots and lots of uh, fantastic single malts and single casks, um, and I've been fortunate enough to taste some incredible blended malts. So um, I think the day of the days of whiskey only being good if it's single malt, high age, dark spirit is uh, is gone. And I think people are now understanding that actually it's the quality in the glass that we should pay attention to first, and then everything after that is is a kind of byproduct um, and it's, it's secondary. So. Blended malts for me, you know, every other category in drinks um, has the pr most premium side of it is, is blending. Um, so for, for us, um, it's, a, it's an old marketing trick that told everybody that blends are, are no good in whiskey. But um, hopefully everyone agrees in this call that that first whiskey was great. And I'm sure the next one, hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy as well. So uh, if we move on to the next whiskey, please, Mr. Lawyers. Yes. That everyone is ready for their second dram. Mm. Okay, everyone looks thirsty, so I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay, so if everyone again, once again picks up their glass, and we'll get a taste first, and then we'll, we'll chat about the whiskey. So if you pick up your glass and give it a swirl, and get your nose into it, you should get that big burst of vanilla, um, some oak and some orchard fruits. And for the second time this evening, cheers everyone, Slange. So immediate, hopefully everyone kind of agrees with what I'm getting here, but for me personally, immediately I get that huge kind of creamy mouthfeel. So this one has got this amazing kind of buttery, creamy mouthfeel, um, which is noticeable from the last dram. The last dram we had was 48%, which is not light, but having this at cast strength at 54.9%, for me, you can get that immediately in the mouthfeel. It's got this kind of creamy quality. The whiskey's kind of bigger and richer and fuller. And then, of course, in terms of flavor profile, you get that kind of creamy, honey, butter, um, and then it kind of goes into this slightly long finish. And you get, for me, you get a little bit of kind of pepper at the back of the tongue, and then it finishes with a little bit of citrus uh, kind of fruit coming through. Just a touch right at the end of the kind of long finish. I get a little bit of kind of citrus kicking in at the end. So, Hopefully you guys all are enjoying that. Um, if anyone has any questions on this, then let me know. Or if anybody's tasting anything different, then let me know because I, you know, we always come up with tasting notes for Timber Beastie and it's always these um, quite complex and intricate flavors. For me, I just get pure sweetness and indulgence and honey. With this one, there's a little bit at the end that I get, I get a bit of pepper, I get a tiny bit of citrus, citrus fruit. But for me, I, I you know, I, this for me is heather honey, cream, butterscotch, all those kind of big, amazing, sweet flavors. I, I must say, again, once again, this shows the versatility of a bourbon cask. Because people always think, a lot of people think that you need to finish in all different kinds of casks to get different flavors, which is actually true. But you can get so much richness from a, from a, from a simple, well, let's say simple bourbon cask as well. So you yeah, get all the different varieties which give from fruitiness to creaminess to to woodiness even and, and some freshness some some sugary there's everything in there i i love bourbon casks to be honest uh, you're absolutely right i mean bourbon casks it's it's kind of people i think people a lot of the time think bourbon cask oak vanilla but you know bourbon casks are so much more complex than that you have you know different sizes which can increase your amount of contact with the woods which makes the flavors more or less intense you have different types of charring, you have different bourbons, you have different regions, um, you know, you have different woods, you have American and you've got European oaks. So it, it's really like, there's so much variety in, in just something as simple as a bourbon cask. Um, so to say that bourbon generates the same flavor all the time is, um, is just not the case. So thankfully with something like Timmer's Beastie, which is 100% bourbon cask aged and matured, you can tell the kind of, uh, you know, the variety of flavors you can get within that. So this as well, just to talk through the spirits in here quickly. So you've got Blair Athel, Dalmore, Glen Goyne, and Glen Geary. And all of these distilleries we marry together to try and create what we believe to be the perfect um, taste of the Highlands region. 
Um, so it's not an easy task because the Highlands is, a, if anyone has seen a map of Scotland and have seen the, the regions, the Highlands is by far the biggest region by land. So the variety that you get from quite far south, you know, just north of Glasgow is where it starts, all the way up to the north coast of Scotland. Um, the variety of, of um, flavours from distilleries and, and, and spirits from distilleries is incredible. So I guess our point of view was to try and make what we thought to be the best taste of the Highlands and, and all of the Highland drams that um, Fred and Chris and Cara absolutely love are those drams with that big kind of head or honey sweetness. It's it's real showcase of, of bourbon maturation. Um, and that's what we, we try to achieve in this in this whiskey. So showcasing bourbon cask and, and showcasing that sort of sweet head or honey spirit is is kind of what we try to try to do. Will, Willem adds to this big, bit, a bit malty and some anise in uh, aftertaste, which is actually, I got the anise as well, and I, I absolutely adore uh, that some, one. Some and anise. Stephen was you... a, a, a small question, who is the beast in the liquid? <laughs> Stefan, the beast can be whoever you want it to be. Ooh. <laughs> so the beast, we've, we've got, so the timorous beastie story, um, for those who aren't aware, is of this, it's, a, it's a named after a Robert Burns poem, To a Mouse. And it's about this, this small little mouse who's quite timid and quite shy. But when he's challenged, he is, he's very strong and powerful. Um, and that's what we believe this, this whiskey is. So the whiskey is, you smell it and it's very sweet and easy and it's nice and highlands and it's beautiful part of the country. But when you taste the spirit, it's, it's punchy. You know, it's still, it's, this particular is 54.9%. Um, and it's it's big flavour, big mouthfeel. So even though the, the whiskey smells heather honey sweet and, and soft, um, it's a it's a big whiskey, um, and that's where the kind of inspiration for um, for the the name Timorous Beastie comes from, and the inspiration for the little mouse on the on the bottle. Which for those of you who can't, don't see it or aren't aware, this is our little friend Timorous Beastie. So you can actually see in this one, he's turned evil because uh, this is cast strength. So we've given him red eyes and a, and a, a, and a dark complexion. Um, but you can see here the normal Timorous Beastie looking a little bit more innocent and friendly. Uh, Walter comments as well, whiskey matured in a bourbon cask is a whiskey naked. You get a lot of the DNA of the distillery. I love it. Well, that's actually... What, what gives all, all these different distilleries, they each have their own uh, typical style and it's more obvious in a bourbon cask, but it's more masked away with, when, when, you, when you put it in a finish or whatever in a yeah. sherry cask. So I, actually, I, I, I think that's a, really, that's a really nice way of putting it. It's, it's kind of the whiskey naked. You're not trying to mask anything. Um, you know, you're, not, you're not trying to cover up the, the original flavor. So I like that. I might, I might steal that for a future tasting. Yeah, well, then. <laughs> if you need to make the meat the beast more than once, or will you think of another angle for a next limited edition? Oh, now, so in the last um, sort of six weeks, we've just uh, finalized our brand plans for 2022. Um, so I don't know how much of an exclusive I can give you tonight because uh, our CEO, Chris, is working in the office next door still. So he might get me into trouble if I tell you too much information. Um, but I can tell you that there is a, a, I can tell you that Meet the Beast will be returning. And there might, there might be a little interesting variety on, on Meet the Beast next year. So uh, the one thing I can tell you is you can put a date in your diaries, which will be Friday the 13th of May. And something interesting will be happening on Friday the 13th of May from uh, Timorous Beastie. All right, sounds great. I would I would say for for those who likes uh, putting in a collection, we'll start collecting the first one then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then get the, you can get the date in your your diary. Yep. Yeah, so uh, uh, Silvio is commenting as well. Uh, I visited all all four, but the most character is I think from the Glengarry. Uh, or am I wrong? He asks. Well, I'm not sure if you. You have the exact uh, composition of this uh, meat to beast, but you would be correct, Chris. I, I, I don't I don't have the, the kind of exact recipes. Um, and if I did, I certainly couldn't tell you. 
Um, but <laughs> I can I can tell you that um, the four dis I mean the four distillers we work with we we work with pretty closely on on other releases, so we have a good amount of spirit from all of these. So I do think the the recipe is quite well balanced between the four distilleries. Um, but I do I do think that for me speaking as a consumer, um, I do feel that Glengarry is is certainly quite prominent. Um, so I, I think if that's what you taste and trust your trust your palate. And it's quite it's, it's a really those who love who love the bottle, Stefan is telling us that there's only seven cases left in uh, Belgium from oh, this God, one. Right. I will say. Yeah, so get get in quick. Um but I think it's a it's a really interesting thing that we can do with the regional malts where you know, with, with all of them, with Timmer's Beastie and Scallywag and Rock Island and Epicurean and Goldrons and Big Pete, you can taste the, the spirit, know what distilleries are in there, and you can almost start to, you know, for the real whiskey geeks, you can start to build in your head what you believe the, the kind of recipe or the ratios to be. So it actually, it's quite, a, it's quite an interesting thing to do, and it's quite a, a cool way to put yourself in the shoes of the master blender. Um, who can you know? You can start to try and understand what what spirit might be in the in the blends. I've always loved the, the concept of the regional malts, actually. So you get a representation, a very good representation of every region in Scotland, much more than you can get from one single malt, let's say. So I've always loved the fact that it's a composition, it's a blend of all uh, these regions. And to be honest, I actually pretty much like all of them uh, because of the fact that you get a very typical style representing each of the of the regions um, so for thanks, those Chris, that's yeah that, that's right no and thanks for that that's that's exactly our goal so you know it, it's a it's a difficult job and it's a it's a big thing to try and give people the ultimate taste of of each distilling region because you know it, it's each distilling region has its own individual characters and, and variety and things like that. So it's a, it's a difficult task to try and take on. But, you know, for us, we have to we have to do it in a way that we think does justice to each region, but also in a way, you know, like Timmer's Beastie, I, I, I said that um, there's so much variety in the Highlands, you can't possibly get everything in one glass. But what we can do is give you what we believe to be the best um, representation of the Highlands. And it's not going to be everyone's best rep representation of the, the Highlands, but it's ours. Um, and it's, it's what we want to, to kind of showcase. So hopefully yeah. everyone, you know, likes it. Um, and, and when you go through the different regions, you can start to really taste. So like the Epicurean, you have from the lowlands, so it's light and fresh and floral and citrusy. And um, you've got Goldrins from Campbelltown, which you get this amazing, like, you know, you get a heather honey sweetness and, and kind of vanilla flavor like you do from the, the Timmer's Beastie, but then it kicks in with this little maritime salty uh, kind of background. And then you move on to Rock Island, which is spectacular, just an amazing balance of salty and smoky and sweet. And then, of course, Big Pete, which is up next, which we'll, we'll try in a little minute. Um, yep. But, you know, this this slide is, is an interesting one because... Obviously, we're we're all here on tonight, and we're trying blended malts, and we're trying single casks, and I, you know I'll maybe tell you guys some some food recommendations. So like Big Pete and, and barbecue smoked meats is incredible, and rock oyster and uh, rock island, sorry, and shellfish and oysters. And um, so we have a uh, you know lo loads of different ways that we can taste whiskey now. It used to just be that you'd had a whiskey uh, in a leather armchair by a fire, and you had to be a seventy year old man to do it. And whiskey's moved on, you know, it's changing. And, and we certainly encourage people to drink whiskey in, in whichever way um, they see fit, in whichever way they like. Um, and one of those ways could be having it in a cocktail, you know. We talk about, as a, as a company that produces great blended malts, we talk about getting different products from different distilleries, high quality, and marrying them together to create something that is a, a better flavor than its individual components. So getting an amazing cocktail is the same same idea. You know, getting an amazing kind of Timmer's Beastie and, and combining it with other superb ingredients to make up an old fashioned, then yeah, absolutely. You know, if that's the way you want to want to drink your whiskey, then I, I encourage you to do it. Um, so for, for us, it's it's you've got to kind of, I suppose, move with the times and, and open your eyes. This is the way that people can enjoy and, and love whiskey, and we we fully encourage it. 
Um, I think an interesting thing as well is when single malt drinkers always say, oh, you should never mix your whiskey. Um, it's criminal. But a single malt is a marriage of thousands and thousands of different casks. So where, where, at which point do you consider it to be a blend? You know, the official word blend, yes, that means that you're mixing distilleries. But, you know, something like a limited edition of uh, Scallywag, you know, the Dinon edition, that will only be two or three casks blended together. Um, so that is a, a very funny kind of intimate blend. Then you can taste a single malt that's thousands and thousands of casks blended together. Um, so it's it's an interesting way of thinking about it. So everything, everything you taste is blended. It's just where you draw the line. And for us, that's why the flavor should always be prioritized. Um, so enjoy what you drink and, and, uh, and I guess don't, buy into this the, the kind of snobbery of, of Scotch whiskey that historically has been has been there. Well there are a few a few uh, interesting suggestions coming up in the chat as well. So apparently there's a suggestion to do a, a Halloween cask strength edition of the ghastly Goldrums. Ooh. So well maybe there's there's an idea for next year. That I think um somebody's somebody we got a mole in here. And keep, keep your eyes peeled for uh, for next year. You'll be seeing something really cool in the Goldrins. Well, I don't know how you ruined it, how you ruined did it, but apparently, well, uh, he, has, uh, he has some cameras hung up there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we've got a mind reader in the audience. Apparently, well, most of the people in the chat would buy it as well. So I guess there's a su su success guaranteed. Talking yeah. about uh, limited editions, uh, actually. Uh, let's say we'll, we'll move on to another limited edition, one that's always very well anticipated every year by lots of fans, uh, which is actually the Big Beat Christmas edition. Yes, indeed. So this is always an exciting time of year. Um, finally, now we're entering November, I can start talking about, uh, I can start talking properly um, about Big Peak Christmas. So this is this year's edition of Big Pete Christmas. You can see that um, our friend Big Pete is on a sledge this year. Um, and if you look close enough, you can see up his kilt, uh, <laughs> which is a, a heavy design flaw. Um, but this is our, our 2021 edition of, uh, of Big Pete Christmas. Um, so I think you can, hopefully some of you can see this, this bottle in the, um, on the screen. And this is, a, this is an indication of how much we've enjoyed this since we opened it. Um, earlier last week. Um, so, oh, now nice. you said Chris is very similar. You've been, well, I, you've shared, been I, shared, I shared mine with all of you guys tonight. So, oh, yeah, that's true. So, this is really exciting. Every year I get really excited to start talking about this. So, every year it gets bigger and bigger and more exciting. So, let's get a sip of it and then I can tell you a little bit more about the whiskey. So, um, give it a swirl in your glass, get your nose into it and smell that peaty goodness. And then give me a cheers and Merry Christmas when it comes, everyone. So straight away, moving from something like Timmer's Beastie to Big Pete, straight away you get Pete. So you get that smoky bonfire, slightly medicinal flavor, but then it kind of levels out a little bit and it starts to get a bit smoky and um, a little bit uh, salt, uh, salty and earthy and leathery. So, it is PT, it is obviously the dominant flavor will also always be peat. But for me this year, you get that big kind of burst of peat when it gets into your mouth and then it fades away and you're left with this really kind of maritime, leathery, salty um, kind of flavor just that, that eases out. So I, I this personally, I, I think this year's Big Peat Christmas is superb. It's cast strength at 52.8%. Um, as with all of the remarkable regional malts, it's non-chill filtered, no artificial colouring, um, and obviously high strength, being a cast strength release. And I just think this year, you know, it's it, it's not as peated as it was last year, in my opinion. So last year, I think you got more of that um, kind of TCP bonfire ash that was more dominant. This year, I think you get a puff of that straight away, and then it levels out to be this really beautiful uh, kind of maritime leathery malt. And of course, even with these peated whiskies, you get this delicious kind of backbone of that sweet bourbon cask. So it's like a, it's like a kind of mattress or a foundation that the whiskey kind of rests on. So 
you're always kind of got this little cushion of, of your vanilla sweetness that helps level out those peaty flavors. Vanilla smoke. That's, I, I definitely get that, Walter. So I'd be interested to know, we're, we, you know, we're in a room where I'm guessing there are some people that will have tried previous Big Peak Christmases. And something that I, I find that uh, people like to do is to compare one year to another. So every time I'm, I'm at, a, at a show or doing a tasting, I always have people come up and say, I love the 2017. I didn't like the 2018, but the 2019 was amazing. So I'd be interested to know if anyone in the room has any... Um, any preferences of their their big peak Christmases, if you can remember? I've always loved the 2017 and the 2016. I wasn't a big fan of the 2018. Uh, it was too too intense, too strong, and too much smoky for me. Yeah. Uh, this one is very very well balanced. It's not only smoke, and I always love I love a peated whiskey, but not when it's only smoke. So yeah, absolutely. For this one again. I would be inclined to agree with you there. Yeah. And there are people who are huge peat heads and the, you know, the peatier the better, the smokier the better. And that's great. You know, we, we, if, if we only had one type of whiskey drinker, this would be a very, very boring world we live in. Um, so it, it's great to have the variety. For me personally, I, I like peat, but I'm not a peat head. So I like peated whiskies, but for me, they always have to be balanced with a little bit of kind of maritime saltiness and sweetness. Um, and this, this for me is is potentially the best Big Peak Christmas I've I've enjoyed. It's not to say it's going to be everyone's favorite, um, but I think for me it's certainly one of my favorites. Yeah, you look adds, adds as well. Uh, um, I feel this one is the most accessible one of the ones I've tried. I absolutely agree with that one. Um, it's it's um, it's a bit softer and sweeter. Um, I agree. This one for me is actually a very fruity, sweet whiskey with a sauce, a smoky sauce on top of it, but it's not only uh, smoke uh, in the palate. Yeah, yeah. Water in degrees, really love this one, very balanced indeed. Good stuff, Walter, that's what we like to hear. I think um, as well, you know, we've tonight we've, we've been lucky enough to try three, um, three limited edition regional malt whiskies, which you can see behind me. Um, and it's, you know, it's, these are not big, big batches. You know, we've got, um, I think the Scallywag Dinon edition is uh, 600 bottles only um, in the world, which are obviously exclusive to Belgium and exclusive to Sunoco. Um, we've got Timmer's Beastie Meet the Beast, which is 3,600 bottles and Big Pete Limited, Big Pete Christmas, which is the biggest limited edition we do. But even then, it's still not a massive, you know, massive amount of, of uh, bottles in the context of things. So um, it's something that we're, we do a lot of at Douglas Lane. I'm sure uh, you can probably see behind me as well with some other limited editions, but um, it's something we've always done a lot of and we'll always be proud to do because limited editions are, are something that as an independent bottler, independent business, we can um, we can do and we can we can create these bespoke bottlings. Um, and we're kind of, we're in a fortunate position where we can do things like Timorous Beastie, 40 years old, um, Epicurean Cote, Cote de Rhone and Reefsal and Wineport and Rubyport casks. So we've got uh, the ability to experiment and, and to create these incredible liquids. So um, the, the kind of important thing is that they always support the core product and they always keep the character of the, the core products. But after that, we, we like to have a little bit of fun with them. I would like to add one more slide you sent me because I think it's quite important to know or to, to show to the people as well. I always loved the range uh, and, well, you added a slide with all the prices and i know awards don't say everything but well if you can show a list like this i think it says something about the quality of the range uh, in my opinion so yeah and you can even see that some of those of some of those are falling off the bottom of the screen and um, so we can we've got uh you know chris you're right awards awards aren't everything um and we you know we will never base our business on on winning awards and stuff like that um but for us it's something that tells us that we're doing something right. So we've, we've been voted as the best independent bottler in the world for the last two years running. Um, and our each of our regional malts, you know, we're constantly striving to make them to make them even better. We're constantly looking at tweaking recipes or, or evolving um, the, the whiskey. So for us to, to, to win, you know, awards when we when we enter them and 
you know, most of the time, thankfully, we, we do. Um, it's, it says something about our, our whiskies. And, and, you know, we always talk about how we prioritise quality and we prioritise high strength and non-chill filtration and no artificial colouring. So for us to be recognised for that means, means a lot to us and, and gives us confidence that we're doing the right thing and we're on the right path. So, yeah, you're right. It's never going to be the most important thing because the most important thing is the whiskey in your glass right now and whether you're enjoying it or not. And that's, that's you know, for will always be the most important thing. But it's it's nice to have the recognition. And it's something that we, as especially as a blended malt, where, where the category, you maybe need a little bit more confidence for people to try, you know, if they're, if they're single malt drinkers and they have a little bit of snobbery about um, blended malts. It gives them the confidence that actually there's, you know, there's professionals who, who really, really rate um, these products very highly. So it just gives, it gives a little bit of extra confidence as well for, a category that people are sometimes a little bit hesitant about at first. Well, I think you got it right there to say at first, because the experience I have at festivals, when I talk about regional malts, people tend to be a bit more uh, withholding, uh, thinking about the fact that it's a blended malt, but they are usually quite easily convinced once they get to try it, once they get to taste it. So yeah, it's yeah. all in... in, in how, how, say, how do they say the proof of the pudding is in eating it? Well, I think it's yes, the proof in the yes. whiskey is, is in drinking it in this case. So I, I couldn't agree more. And, that, and that's why we always talk about, you know, the, the taste comes first. Um, the most important thing is what you're drinking right now in your glass and whether you're enjoying it. Um, so, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a, there's a cruel little trick um, that Chris, our, our CEO, plays on people sometimes at a whiskey show. If you get... Sometimes you get people who say, I will never drink a blended malt. No, no, I'm not interested in trying it. I will never drink it. And then Chris will sometimes say, well, I actually have this amazing 30-year-old uh, Port Ellen single cask if you want to try it. And then he gives them a dram of Big Pete 12 years old or something. And they say, oh, this is fantastic. This, is, this whiskey is beautiful. And then Chris obviously goes to tell them that it's actually a, a blended malt at 12 years old. So there's, there's sometimes... There's sometimes just a, an easy way like that to break down perception. Um, and, and I guess the message from that is, you know, prioritize the taste in your glass. Never, never judge a whiskey by its cover. If it's really pale, really light, it doesn't mean it's any worse than a whiskey that's really dark. If it's really young, it doesn't mean it's worse than any whiskey that's really old. And if it's a blended malt, it certainly doesn't mean it's any worse than any single malt or single cask out there. Um, and, in, you know, in the same breath, people write off single grain sometimes. and There's single single cast single grains out there that are utterly phenomenal um, and, and need to be tried. And even, you know, blended scotch. There are, there are a number of blended scotches out there that in the right environment can be fantastic. So um, I would say keep, keep your mind open when, when drinking whiskey for sure. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Well, talking about all these great blended malts, well, let's switch to single malt uh, for now. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think that's a, it's a nice moment to end on. So we're, we've, done the, we've done the blended malt section um, and, and hopefully you guys all really enjoyed it and you got a, you got a really nice variety because we went from Speyside over to the, the Highlands at Castrend and then over to, to Isla. Um, and now we're going to venture back um, over to the Highlands with a... A uh, single cask, single malt of Glen Geary. So I think Chris is just pulling up. Now, you're, what you might have in the bottle and glass might look a little bit different to mine because I've got the, the original cask sample. So um, you guys will, will obviously have the, the official bottling, which has is, is made its way um, to Belgium. And this is a really special whiskey because this for us is a, a really important and a, a really good kind of passion project where we get to, we have the, the privilege to sit down um, and, and do a tasting with some of the best uh, retailers across Belgium. Um, and we get to taste a number of, of we hand select um, about normally around 15 incredible single cask products. Um, and we sit down in a room with these retailers and, and we'll do a tasting until um, it gets to the point that, that we start at almost a kind of uh, almost kind of bidding on, on who wants to, to take what casks and how, how they might share casks. And it's a really, it really encapsulates the spirit of whiskey for me. And it encapsulates the spirit of independent specialist retailers where, um, you know, everyone's in it together. 
Um, and and it's, a, it's a really special thing for us to be able to do in partnership with Sunoco. So um, the result is that, that we have these amazing single casks that we release exclusively for Belgium. Um, and we, tonight we've got three of them. Um, and this is the first. So this is a Glengarry 11 years old. So it's a 48.4%. So still high strength, but not cask strength. And what you're tasting tonight is one of 285 bottles. So if everyone gives it a little swirl in their glass and gets your nose into it, you should get spice and a bit of nut and sweetness. So for me, I get that kind of roasted pistachio nut. So those kind of sweet nuts. And then it kicks in with a little bit of spice. And we can all have a little sip now. So cheers, everyone. Slange. Lunch. I mean, nice to add, this is uh, an exclusive bottling uh, chosen by uh, Huis Windels and Vinny Spirit uh, we're trying now. Yes, precisely. Um, so if you, if, you, if you are looking to purchase a bottle of this, those are, um, those are the places to get it from. And the mouthfeel on this is incredible. You get that kind of mouth coating sweetness. Um, but I think buttery brioche I love as, as a tasting note because it is that kind of malty bready sweetness. Um, and it does kind of coat your mouth and, and melt in your mouth a little bit the way a brioche does. And then, of course, that, that vanilla. That is absolutely stunning. Um, this is the first time uh, since the tasting that I've, I've been able to taste these. So um, I've, I've not tasted this in ooh, four or five months. So it's, it's amazing to be able to get this back, um, back in a glass. This is incredible. And I'm really pleased at how this has turned out. Because when we taste it, it comes out a, a cast sample. Um, and then we go through the process of designing the labels and bottling um, and, and doing all of this. So, um, and then obviously getting it from Scotland to Belgium, which Stefan will know is not always straightforward. Um, so, <laughs> so what we've left with is it's amazing when you, when you finish this project and you get something as, as stunning as this in the, in the glass. So hopefully everyone is enjoying this with me. Well, uh, um, Jeroen has uh, got chocolate chip cookie, the ones that are a little moist in the middle. <laughs> the best kind. The best kind, indeed. Very creamy and still some fresh citrusy notes, some barley notes uh, at the back. Slight tobacco flavor from Willem. Nice. So everyone getting something a little bit different, which is great. This is this is the other beautiful thing about whiskey is every time we we you know I'll I'll present a whiskey to you but I I'm telling you what I taste um, and what what our master blender um, our master distillers taste uh, distillers taste so it's not it's not what we're telling you to taste it's simply a guide as to and maybe some some helpful things that we taste so everyone will get something different everyone's palate's different um, so whatever you're tasting is um, if it's different to what you're hearing then great. Uh, you're picking up some some stuff that um, we maybe didn't get, so it's a good place to be. Well, maybe for those who still have the Samiris Beastie a bit left in their glass, there was a remark earlier on, so is there a bit of Glengarry or is there more Glengarry in there as well? But maybe there's a way now to, get, to try or to, to compare them both. Uh, yeah, and try and to I'll, I'll, it. yeah, and I'll tell you from my point of view, um, the the thing that that and the Timmer's Beastie have in common is that creamy vanilla, brioche, butterscotch flavour. So you've got, I mean, in terms of all the whiskies we've tasted so far tonight, the creaminess of those two really stands out for me in terms of mouthfeel. So I, I think there is a fair assumption to to say that a lot of that might be the influence of the, the Glengarry and the, and the Timmer's Beastie. Well, Willem apparently went back to the BC, so he's very nice now. Um, well, most of these whiskies always, when they, th that's the thing, if you, if you have the character to leave some in your glass, uh, it's always nice to, you're always rewarded with some evolution uh, in these whiskies as well, so always nice. Yeah, absolutely. Something that I, uh, I like to do is, if you get an amazing kind of big sweet whiskey, or in fact, it works with a lot of whiskies, it works with peat, it works with sweetness, and it works with sherry uh, fruitiness. But leave your glass overnight. Your your wife or our partner might get annoyed um, at, at leaving dirty glasses out in the counter. But sometimes I like to leave them overnight and come back in the morning and, and smell these empty glasses. And the, the smell of them is just phenomenal. 
Um, you get you get so much of that once the oxygen gets into the the whiskey and starts to influence it, it just opens it up and, and can be really really stunning. Again, Jeroen adds that this whiskey is all about texture for me, mouthfeel and creaminess. That's definitely the case. The creaminess is 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 key uh, for this one for me as well. Yeah. Combined yeah. with some vanilla and and and, and tropical fruits, uh, definitely. So yeah, love it. Love it. Good tasting, I already guys. loved the sample when we tried it, and I love the result in the bottle now as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you and I can relate to that. Uh, have a tasting and leave 250 used glasses in your car overnight. <laughs> yeah. I've yeah. had a similar experience, and well, I can. Uh, I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, just don't get pulled over by the police. They can get the wrong impression. Yeah, well, I think the, the, the device they put in the car to measure the air, I think it will explode at that time. <laughs> at that so, yeah, I think you might be right. <laughs> it's a good way to lose your driver's license. <laughs> wow. But well, this was a very great start, as, uh, if I'm honest. Thank you, Chris. And just while you guys are enjoying the rest of that whiskey, I'm going to tell you a little bit about us. So um, I'm guessing... Hopefully, most of you in this, on this call will be aware of who we are, aware of Douglas Lane. Um, but for those who are, are maybe less familiar, um, these are the three things that really build our DNA. So at Douglas Lane, we, we, we kind of, you know, we're an independent family-owned business that's now in its third generation. Um, we're based in Glasgow, and the, the kind of three things that really build our DNA are, are our heritage, so, we, you know, we've been around for, for 73 years and established in 1948. So we're one of the oldest independent bottlers. Um, and it's not just, you know, being old doesn't make you good, but it certainly allows you the chance to have experience and allows you the chance to, to build relationships. So our heritage for us means that we have access to some of the best distilleries, best wood, best casks all over Scotland. Um, so it, it builds our, our kind of, um, foundation for, for where we are today. So it's incredibly important for us to, to acknowledge that. And not to mention as a family-owned business, you know, that's that's Cara's grandpa. Um, so it's, it holds a really special place in our heart that this, this kind of establishment of the business as well. Um, credentials are another thing that, that really build part of our DNA. So especially with products like the regional malts, being recognized and, and knowing that we're doing the right thing um, is, is really important for us. So um, as, a, as a kind of, you know, being recognized as, as one of the best in the, in the independent bottling industry is, is great. Um, so, so and, and as you saw before, the products winning all these awards gives us a lot of confidence that we're doing the right thing. Um, and then finally, and, and maybe most importantly, it's the, the kind of credibility of our liquid and the, um, the kind of preaching um, our, our kind of motto is natural as it gets. Um, so our whiskey is always at high strength. Uh, it's always no artificial colouring and non-chill filtered. Um, and for us, that's that's possibly the most important thing that we do um, because it, it makes you know that everything in our glass is natural. We're not trying to hide anything. Um, and it gives you confidence that we're prioritising the, the flavour of the whiskey um, and nothing else. We don't want to make our whiskey clean. We don't want to make it crystal clear. We don't want to make it dark. Um, we just want to make it taste good. Um, and that, that's kind of, that will always be uh, our biggest goal and our biggest priority. So hopefully the whiskeys you taste tonight, you can see the variety of color. You can see the fact that some of that thick creaminess that you get from non-chill filtration. And hopefully you all agree that that adds to the quality of, of the liquid. And then I think there's maybe another slide, Chris, where it just shows you a little, yeah. So this is a little timeline. I just like this because it shows a photo of Cara as a baby. Um, which for somebody that works for her is, uh, is quite entertaining. Um, but you can see here a little timeline of, of, uh, of the company. Um, obviously, we had Fred Sr. Um, who, who established the business in, in uh, 1948. Um, and then his son, Fred, who's now our chairman at 70 years old, um, took over the business um, and then passed it on very recently to, uh, to Cara and her husband, Chris. So Fred is still involved in the business as our chairman. Um, but the, the kind of business now on a day-to-day -day basis has been run by Cara and Chris. Um, so you've got this it's really exciting time to be at Douglas Lane. We have the, the experience of, of our chairman, Fred, and the, and the history and the stories. And you've got this, this ambition and, and real excitement um, coming through from, from Chris and Cara as the younger generation. Um, so 
you can see as well that in 2009, we started our regional malts. And since then, it's, it's been a really exciting journey to watch those grow and flourish. Um, and then even more excitingly, as you'll see in a couple of slides time, um, we are now as of 2019, so two years ago, we can now add distillers to our title um, because we acquired Strathern Distillery um, in 2019. Um, and then there's more exciting news on that uh, as well to come, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, um, which is our second distillery, which is which is uh, we talk about at the end of this presentation. So that gives you a little flavour of our and a very quick snapshot of who we are and, and a bit about our history. Um, so hopefully for those of you who don't know much about Douglas Wing and, and the people behind the bottles of, of Big Pete and these fun brands, um, then you, you maybe know a little bit more about us now. Any questions coming in, Chris, or are people getting thirsty for their... Uh, for oh, their there's mostly, mostly business going on, people ordering bottles from each other, so... Uh... <laughs> Good. That's what we like to hear. All right. Well, if everyone's ready, then I think we can maybe move on to our fifth whiskey of the evening. Yes, here we go. All righty. So here we've got an old particular, Kalila, 10 years old. So again, this is a result of, um, of that amazing project that we did with the, the retailers across Belgium. Um, and we, uh, we've come up with this. And um, this was one of the, the uh, casks that was selected as part of this project. Um, and this one actually was selected by Sunoco. Um, so of all the casks that went out to the retailers, um, there, were, there were some casks that were left and Sunoco decided that this one was too special um, to let anyone else have any of it. Um, so Stefan and, and, uh, and his team um, decided to bottle this as, a, as an exclusive um, for, for Belgium. So it's, again, you know, a, a really unique um, and exciting concept um, that's resulted in 296 bottles exclusively for Belgium of this Kalila 10 years old. So if everyone gives it a little swirl in their glass to get some oxygen into it, a little nose, you'll get a... Straight away, I'm surprised at how phenolic that is. Kalila for me is normally really maritime salty and you don't get much uh, phenol. But for me, you get a big hit of phenol on that and then you get that kind of oceanic hit. And I'll now let you guys drink. So cheers, everyone. Slange. Okay. Wow. Okay, so for me... That is a meaty Kalila. I mean, that is big, big kind of flavor. For, uh, sometimes with Kalila, I find them quite light and fresh, um, salty, maritime. This for me is taking on a real big body. It's got a real substance to it. Um, you know, smoked meat, I think is definitely right. That kind of smoked brisket. And then that kind of peat you get coming through. Less of the maritime saltiness and freshness, more of that smoky kind of meat flavor. And yeah, then yeah. If, you, would, you, really as well, um, you wouldn't guess that this is a Kalila in a blind tasting, maybe no. because of the additional meatiness you get. Uh, You're in absolutely this one. right. You're absolutely right. That That's why, I mean, some of you may have seen I'm quite visibly surprised by that. That is big for a Kalila. I mean, it's absolutely delicious. It's got a lot of substance to it. Um, in a blind, no, you, Chris, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, well, I've drank a lot of Kalilas. Douglas Lang's a big fan of Kalila. We have a lot of Kalila casks. Um, so I've tasted a lot of Kalilas and uh, that's quite an original for me. That's really, I mean, really kind of full flavoured, a lot of meaty body to that. It's great. And then again, in that finish, it kind of, once you've got that kind of meatiness that fades out, you're left with this kind of really nice sweetness that lingers in your mouth. Well, really, for, me, for me, I still see think why Kalila is for me uh, still one of the most underestimated distilleries on Isla. People yeah. always talk about the big three, but well, I think this is always, always a cracker. That's stunning. I can see why Stefan didn't want to share this with anyone else. <laughs> yep, fatty, full body, nice citrus at the end, and honey sucky as we know it, uh, Silvio S. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, yeah, nicely put. I think, um, do you know what's interesting is most of the Kalilas that we release, 
will be 46 or 48.4%. I think the extra kind of meatiness you get from this one comes in the extra ABV where you, you keep all of that cast strength goodness. So this is 56.6%, um, which is, is obviously, you know, high strength, but I think the whiskey holds up really, really nicely. Um, I think the bigger, the more intense flavor that you get from this allows you to have it at that higher strength. Um, of course, if people think it's a wee bit too punchy or a little bit too sharp, um, then don't be afraid to add a, add a wee drop or two of, uh, of H2O um, and to soften out a little bit. But for me, I, I personally think, you know, sometimes I taste a 56% whiskey and I think it's way too strong and it should have been reduced and the spirit doesn't hold up to, the, to match the intensity of the, the strength. But I actually think that that works beautifully. So I think that's stunning. Um, but, you know, that's just my palate. I drink whiskey every day, so my palate's probably not in a good place. <laughs> so if, if somebody else thinks that they need a, a little bit of water, and then please do go for it. Walter says, uh, I love the freshness in the finish. Works well with the smoke. That's the thing I always get from a Kalila. There's always some fresh uh, freshness in there. Com combined with some earthy smokiness and it's when it's well balanced and it usually is with Kalila you get yeah. a, a fantastic drum actually so yeah. yeah you do and you know it's a good it's a good point Chris because I think it, it's it showcases nicely um that good whiskies don't always have to be old whiskies um oh. Kalila is something where you know Kalila is amazing and if you get a you know 20 25 year old Kalila yeah, do you know, it'll probably be very good. It'll probably be really rich and sweet and indulgent and, and nice, but you lose that freshness and you lose that maritime saltiness and you lose that raw kind of real character that you get with Kalilas that make them stunning. Um, so I, you know, I like an old whiskey from time to time and, and they can be great and they can be really um, kind of Moorish and smooth and delicious, but there's something about a young, you know, I know this one's 10 years old, but there's something about a young five or six year old Kalila or Talisker or something where you get this freshness. It tastes like the sea. It tastes like the sea air. Um, and you don't get that with the older whiskies. So older whiskies are not better than younger whiskies and younger whiskies aren't better than older whiskies, but they have different qualities in generally speaking. Um, yeah. You know, I guess in, the end, in the end, it all comes down to the cask and the wood. So uh, maybe that's a good segue to one of the slides you sent me uh, as well, because, well, I think if you get a good cask, it doesn't need to be in there for 20 plus years uh, to get to, to produce something wonderful. So 100%. it's a nice way to, to talk a bit about wood and, 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 and the combination of woods and spirits. A lovely segue, Chris. It's almost like you're going to pull up a slide here about wood. Well, there you go. Oh. <laughs> Seamless. Uh, so, as Chris has, has very kindly segued for me, um, yeah, it's something like we don't have control over the spirit, really. You know, we, we work with distilleries who we trust and we know produce great first class spirit. Um, so we, we don't have control, but we have confidence over that part of the process. But the process that we have control over is the wood. Um, we purchase the best wood from all over the world um, and we are, we are experts in wood. That is really where we geek out. Um, so we, we access uh, casks from different uh, bourbon distilleries, different bourbon producers, different regions, different um, cask sizes, different types, different charring. Um, and it's an area where we can, get, we can get really involved in the spirit. So you can see this here, you know, I've mentioned it before, but around 70% of the flavor of your whiskey comes from the wood. Um, and this chart gives you a little bit of an idea about some of the flavors you can expect from different kind of types of of wood so you know you, there's different ways in which you can char and toast wood it can be lightly done and, and sometimes if you age it for a long period of time and a lightly um, burnt and a lightly charred cask you get much softer much more delicate flavors that gather intensity over time sometimes you can put it in a heavily charred cask for you know a very short period of time and, and come out with really really big amazing flavors so this slide here hopefully gives you an idea of some of the flavors that you can expect from kind of different charrings of wood. And these are stuff that we always are considering when we're getting spirit and we're, we're putting it into wood. So, you know, it's for us, it's a case of 
trying to understand the, the spirit, trying to understand what we want from each cask, trying to understand the breakdown of flavors and how they'll react with the wood and, and using our, our experience, our previous experience and, and knowing how that might happen. Um, and then it's just a case of trying to execute it. So it's putting it in this amazing wood, knowing how long we should put it in for, constantly tasting it. So um, our sample room at any one time has about four or 5,000 samples in it. Um, and we get samples arriving at the office every single day um, from various casks to be tasted. So it's a constant, constant process. Um, we have our sort of next 30 years or so uh, cask program planned out. Um, but of course, every single cask within that is always subject to tasting and shifting and, and stuff. So it's really complicated process, but it, um, it's a fun one because we get to drink loads of whiskey. Um, you know, every so often, I'll, this is my desk at the office, and uh, every day or two or three days, I'll get Chris run through to me from next door and say, oh my God, you have to taste this and put something under my nose that is just, you know, 10 out of 10. Um, and at that point, it's a case of phoning up the production manager and saying, this is ready. We need to bottle it, you know, as soon as possible. Um, or we need to release this soon. So it's it's really exciting part of the process. Um, and it shows you the, the kind of care and attention that we put into to every single cask and every single blended malt that we, we produce. Great. Well, in, in the meantime, in the chat, there are a few things that have passed uh, by as well. Maybe sacrilegion to some. I, I actually love uh, the, the suggestions. There are some suggestions to do some cocktails with this Kalila. So uh, Jeroen wants to make uh, a Negroni with this one, so why not? Hey, why not? Absolutely. After that, why not do a penicillin uh, cocktail? So, yeah. Yeah, a Negroni with that sounds quite good to me. Can I, yeah. can I come? <laughs> <laughs> I'll private, I private message to everyone the, 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 the coordinates to, to get to Jeroen now, so... Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm there. Good. Oh. All right, well, we still have one bottle left and it's, well, not just a whiskey uh, to, to finish with. So on to a, a sixth bottle now. It's a Tamdu. Yes, it is a Tamdu. And, you know, quite, quite often people will say finish on a PT whiskey. But, you know, I was looking at the order to do these in tonight and this one just made sense for me to finish on. It's, it is a big whiskey. It's punchy. Um, look at the colour of it, it's absolutely spectacular uh, and it's this is dessert in a, in a whiskey. Um, so this is a 67% cast strength, um, Tam Du, 14 years old. Um, and it will, will not surprise you to hear that this has been aged in a sherry butt. Um, I'm sure you can see by the colour that it's, it's absolutely stunning. Um, so for us, you know, this is, um, it would be a wee bit silly not to finish this whiskey. Even when you swirl it around your glass, you can see that when it, when it finishes swirling, you can see the syrupy texture of it as it settles back into the, the liquid, which is just incredible. So for the final time tonight, everyone, cheers. Slange. I'll give you a proper dink. Oh, my heavens to Betsy. <laughs> that is stunning. So the, the texture of that is absolutely outrageous. Um, I, I went to sip this and I thought something had happened because it took so long to come out of the glass. It's like syrup. Um, that's stunning. So it's, it's massive, massive sherry bomb up front, but it's not. Sometimes a sherry bomb can be a little bit too intense and a little bit too tanniny. For me, that's not the case at all. I think you get a really nice balance. You get the raisins, fruitcake, real dark Demerara sugar. And then you get that kind of mocha, kind of to finish, you get that little bit of kind of mocha. Yeah, yeah that is, um, that's quite well, special. Again, this is, this is one of these um, whiskies that came from the, the retailer project that we did where we sat down and, and did this um, cask tasting with, with some of the, the finest retailers across um, across Belgium, so um, you know we're really well. I think Chris, you've got the list, don't you? It's Walter B and um, and a few others. Is that right? Sorry, 
the the owners, the proud owners of this cask. I think we've got Walter, yeah. Walter Again. and a yep. few others. Yeah, it's Walt, Walter B. Uh, it's Drum 242 and uh, it's uh, Huis Windels. Um, yes. Again, selected Again, discount yeah. bottles. So you can find, I mean, I, I'm sure most people in this tasting will be going to buy a bottle of this. Um, but these, those are the proud owners of, of this cask and um, they've obviously done a, a good job of selecting because um, this is really special. It's a great whiskey to finish on. Um, this is, you know, this is a proper armchair whiskey. Um, and I think, I, you know, I'm, I'm always a little bit skeptical of sherry bombs, if I'm honest. Um, I, I love great whiskey, scallywag, I, you know, I adore. Um, but I sometimes think that sherry bombs overdo it. And it's the temptation to leave it in for too long and get it really dark and that becomes the priority. I, I'm never a fan of, I like to keep some kind of balance in the whiskey and I don't like that tanniny. It's the same with wines. I hate really tanniny wines. But this for me, the, the cask has been pulled out, you know, on the perfect day because if it was any less sherried, it wouldn't have that same intensity. If it was any more sherried, I think it would be imbalanced. Um, but hopefully you all agree that this is a, a really, really stunning whiskey. Well, a lot of agreement with you in uh, in the chat as well. Nice sherry in balance. Uh, alcohol doesn't bother at all. There's a yeah. few of the well well in integrated alcohol uh, as well. So and Jeroen likes to quote Janice from Friends. Um, I'm not gonna do an impression, but I. Oh my god! My god. <laughs> <laughs> but there was there was one question from uh, from Walter. Uh, at what at what alcohol percentage was this uh, put into cask? Because it's at after fourteen years, it is still at sixty seven percent, which must mean that it was probably filled up at receiver strength. I would love to have the answer to that question for you, um, Chris, but I have no idea. Um, that is a I, I can find out. I mean, that's a piece of information that probably only the master blender would have a record of. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, the, the one thing I know is it would have been high. Obviously, an, you know, angel share varies with each cask and there's no science behind how much you lose in, in angel share. Um, but certainly, you know, some casks leak percentage really quickly. We've had casks at 14, 15, 16 years old before that have gone below 40% and they, they lose loads of, of strength really quickly. And there's others that, that maintain strength really, really well. So I guess it has gone in high, but I guess also the cask is is uh, is particularly has done particularly well at maintaining that strength. Yeah. Well, but again, it's even at sixty seven percent, it doesn't attack you. Uh, to be honest, the, uh, the alcohol all. bothering at, at all. So yeah, damn, I, I totally agree. Bad. And it, it might it might have something to do with the fact that we've already drank I think three cast strength whiskeys tonight. Um, but you know you're you're right. I think um, this has got enough intensity, enough mouthfeel to hold its own at sixty seven percent, which is not an easy thing. Um, you know most most whiskeys I taste at sixty seven percent, I add some water to, um, because normally it, it needs it a little bit. Um, but I I will, personally wouldn't add a drop of water to this. Um, I think it's it's absolutely stunning as it is. In fact, yeah. there's this there's this much left in the the sample bottle. I think I'll be taking the majority of that home with me tonight. <laughs> the majority. <laughs> I have to leave. I have to leave some for uh, for future sampling occasions. And we need some left in the office. But uh, I'll be taking some of that back with me tonight. I think. Yeah, well, apparently it, 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 it's like a, a perfect medicine as well because I got a comment, goodbye flu. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can responsibly suggest this as medicine. Um, but yeah, certainly, like a whiskey a day keeps the doctor away. That's what we say. Yep. Well, we got, we got three really uh, fantastic single casks uh, to try uh, tonight. But maybe this... Since I still have a slide uh, for you, yes. uh, Dale, we should, there are quite should have a few slides. Others. You don't get enough. There are a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of other exceptional single casks available at Douglas Ling. So maybe Dale, you can tell us a bit more about that as well. Of course, all yeah. available. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. So we, we we obviously do the remarkable regional malts, and that's a, that's a really special range of whiskies that we do. Um, but in addition to that, you know, 
Another, another feather to our, our cap is that we do this range of exceptional single casks. So what you're trying tonight are all single casks that are exclusive to Belgium. Um, so that's really, you know, really specialist. And that's the kind of stuff that we love to be able to do. Um, but, you know, we, we also have a number of other releases that we, we do globally. So Sunoco, for example, um, every year they will, they will uh, hand select a number of, of other single casks that they, that they share with other distributors across the world. And um, so we have four, four brands in this portfolio. We've got Provenance, which is, is normally quite entry level ages. So you've got everything from five to 12 years old. Um, all single malts. Same with Premier Barrel, tends to be a little bit younger, mostly Highland and uh, Speyside releases. So ones that really focus on that sweetness. Um, and that's the, that's the only one that we do in a ceramic decanter. So really cool for gifting. Old Particular, which is the kind of heart of this range. So that, that is our kind of core product within this, this range. Um, and we release, you know, single malts and single grains from anything from 10 years old or 12 years old, all the way up to, to you know, 30, 35 year old grains um, that we do. And then XOP, which is our, our kind of um, crown jewels. Um, these are, are the kind of creme de la creme. These are the, the kind of hand selected, um, really premium cast that we release. So these are the old ones that come in a, a wooden box with a plinth, um, the kind of ones that that uh, you need to save up for um, a little bit, but a uh, but tend to be pretty pretty spectacular casks with really big name distilleries and and really high aged single grains, and they're always uh, always at cast strength. So we do we work with around sixty distilleries over Scotland to to release these these casks, and uh, we'll always release them at high strength without uh, coloring and, and non chill filtered, same as the. A, same as the blended malts. And then I think, Chris, there's maybe one or two more slides, unless yeah. anyone has any questions on that. Yeah, well, it, the story doesn't end there, of course, because, well, now we have uh, some uh, additional distilleries. They have already got mentioned tonight. Well, yes. Perfect time to tell a bit more about those as well. Yeah, so so for 71 years, Douglas Lane, we're, we're leading independent bottlers and blenders, um, and we, we did a good job of that. Um, but in 2019, we acquired Strathairn Distillery in the Highlands. Um, so this is a, a boutique, really um, great distillery up in the up in the Highlands um, that we are now working in, in producing our own spirit and, and releasing our own casks and, and doing some really interesting um, aging here. So it, the production is quite small um, and it's it's really specialist. So over the next year or two, you should be seeing more more of Strathairn available. Um, and it's a, a really cool project for us to, to get involved in. So after, yeah, after 71 years of being bottlers and blenders, we're now distillers, bottlers and blenders. Um, and as if one distillery wasn't keeping us busy enough, um, we also announced uh, recently, or quite recently, um, that we will be opening Clutha Distillery. Um, so this will be uh, launching next year um, after some delays, thanks to COVID and various other factors, um, but we're, we're, we're really proud to, to announce this distillery um, launch next year. Um, and it's it's currently in the process of being built. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for, for news about Clutha Distillery um, over the coming uh, kind of months and years. Um, and, and hopefully in a few years time, you're all sitting in a tasting where we get a chance to, to try some whiskey, um, some Scotch whiskey from, from Clutha. Um, so it's an incredibly exciting time to to be part of Douglas Ling, um, and hopefully you you guys all um, have enjoyed the whiskies tonight, and and you've got some stuff to get excited about next year and and in the coming years to follow as well. Well, thank you. Well, before we, we before we end, um, I always try to find out which of the whiskies we tried was your favorite, as if there was a bad one in there, uh, of course, but. There's always one that's your favorite, and I'm always a bit curious about that, so I prepared a little poll uh, for that as well. Ooh, so fun. maybe we can just uh, do that one now, and we'll see what the result uh, will uh, bring us. Here we go. Ooh, and I will be monitoring here the votes as they come in, which is always uh, nice to see, so... Tough one, Chris. It's a tough one. Yeah, and well, it's always interesting to see how the vo how the votes evolve. And I can already say that it's yeah, this is interesting. This is nice, actually. I 
Do okay, we got 13 gonna... out of 19 votes. There's two people who haven't voted yet. 18, one more. Oof. I think people must have loved everyone. Sorry? I think these people must have loved everyone. Yeah, well... Can we vote? Right. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Well, it's actually fantastic to see. I will share the results. Here we go. As you can see, we have a tie. Whoa! Which is nice, but what, what, what I always uh, uh, enjoy the most in these votes is that every single bottle has got at least one vote, which means that every bottle has a right of existence. Uh, and that's always nice to see because, well, in a lineup like this, well, it's always a tough competition. But, um, well, I really love the results. As you can see, Timur's Beastie, Timur's Beastie. Quite, made quite an impression as well. Yeah. That's amazing. That's great yep. to see. And for, further proof that, uh, you know, everyone's palette is different. And if it would be a very, very boring world if we all had the same palette and all only liked the same whiskey. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, people are asking, can we vote twice? Well, of course, we, uh, well, not, not really, but well, I guess the results were quite uh, clear uh, on this one. Uh, Jeroen says as well, everything was great tonight, but I didn't expect anything less. Uh, to be honest, I was actually having the same idea. Uh, I've never been disappointed, not by the regional malts and uh, most definitely not by the single casks either. There's a reason why they call it remarkable regional malts and there's a reason why they call it exceptional single casks well i guess we got a good example of those uh, and why it is called that way as well so thank you very much dale i don't know if there are any questions or remarks uh dale there's a question or will you be in the in the hague uh, this year uh, i i actually will be in the hague yes um be traveling out next week all right but Just there's there's Maybe, maybe a, a more important question. Will you be at Spirits in the Sky? <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, a, a more important and more disappointing answer is no. Um, uh, so I have my, my best friend's uh, wedding on the same day, on the 13th. So I, I'm, I'm giving a, a speech at my best friend's wedding. So unfortunately, I won't be there. But um, you'll be in very, very capable hands of, uh, of Didier and, the, and Stefan and the Sunoco team. So... Um, they'll keep you right, and I will. I can definitely tell you, I'll be back in Belgium at the absolute earliest opportunity. That right. for sure. Des desperate to get traveling and desperate to get back to Belgium. Well, it's the same thing here, but we're desperate to get to Scotland. To be honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's busy at the moment. We've got uh, the climate conference on just now, so it's about, there's about yeah three hundred thousand more people in Glasgow than normal. All right. Well, Willem is, uh, is saying goodbye because he has to start his birthday party tonight. So I guess, Willem, as an aperitif, this could count. Uh, not everyone can get to start his birthday this way. So have a nice evening. Um, yes. And happy and birthday. Anyone else still has uh, some questions or some remarks? And just, just before, uh, Chris, can we maybe get a wee photo just before we, we say goodbye to some people? Yes, of course. So everyone, if you can give me a little wave. Lovely. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, time for a couple more questions, if anyone has any. Yeah. I do, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, oh, Dirk, um, it's coming in. Um, you have the new double barrel. Um, in the earlier ones were uh, written which cask were uh, in the whiskey. Now you only have the, the region. Uh, can mm. you explain why the, the, the sudden change? So that's double barrel. It's actually not the case. So double barrel has always had two core products. You've yeah. always had the Isla and the Highland and the Space Side and the Lowland. But what we did do was we launched some limited edition releases. And the limited editions, we would sometimes name the distilleries. We would sometimes have an age statement. We would sometimes, you know, do a combination of the two. So at the moment, we have the two core products available in the new packaging, which if anyone hasn't seen it, is, is stunning. It's a, a kind of square bottle. You can kind of see if I can find one for you. Um, but if you, if you get a chance to see it, it's really, really nice. Um, and we will be releasing some limited editions again, Dirk. Um, I think hopefully next year, I can't promise, but 
Um, when we do release limited editions, these will have distillery names and or age statements on it. Um, so the two core products have stayed the same, just the pack has changed. Um, and the, the distillery names are on the limited editions, which we'll, we'll bring back. Um, oh, yes, Chris. Beautifully done. So this is the new pack of Double Barrow. That's the Isla and, and Highland version. But does that, does that answer the question, Dirk? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, thanks. Lovely, you're welcome. All right, guys, any more questions before we go back and enjoy the rest of our whiskeys that's left in the glasses? Yeah, uh, uh, Walter is asking, have you ever released a single cask of bourbon whiskey or are there any plans to do so? Ooh. So a single cask of bourbon? No. No. We're, we stick, we'll stick with scotch. We stick to what we're good at. <laughs> we'll let the bourbon... That's, that's the one that's the most... That, that's the easiest one uh, available or, or isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll let, we'll let the bourbon producers stick to the bourbon. We'll stick to the scotch, I think. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I just wanted to add um, to all the guys that are still here. Um, great thanks for participating to all these masterclasses. This was the last in a row this year of 24 masterclasses that we set up uh, with Sinoco Spirits. Um, I wanted also to add that still some casks from are on his way from, from Scotland to, to Belgium and, and to, to other regions. And one of these casks is going to, to Zammel, Jan. Uh, so that's a liquid that we could not taste, but I'm sure that when you jump into Jan's shop in December, that he will have the opportunity to make you taste this fabulous whiskey that he selected. And um, so Jan is also one of the guys that took one full cask uh, from Douglas Lane. And there is another one that is uh, going to Straffe Hoek. Um, Dirk, tell me the address or the city or the village or the where it is. Uh, I stopped them back. In I stopped them back that also took a full cask. Uh, Spaber. Of? Spaber. Ah, Spaber, yeah. So that these, uh, these casks were not in the, in the lineup, but were also selected. So extra casks, extra samples uh, to come for 2022 and a full year to organize uh, everything around it. Uh, so Dale, nice <laughs> challenge for next yes, year. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and, and you know, Stefan's absolutely right. It's a, for us, this is a, a real passion project. Um, it's a lot of work and it's, you know, it's a, it's a complex project. Um, and unfortunately in a year where COVID and Brexit and everything has hit, it's been posed more challenges than it normally would. So we're, we're unfortunately being subject to some delays from, from various suppliers and transporters. So if anyone's been impacted by that, you know, we, we can't apologize enough. It's, it's not a position we like being in. Um, but, you know, if, you know, no, from our point of view, we're doing everything we can and, and we really, really love doing these projects and, and love and really value doing it with, with, uh, with Sunoco and, and with these retailers in Belgium, because um, you know working on, on projects like this in, in the independent retailers is is really the um, the thing that makes us get up in the morning and the things that make us um, love doing these projects. So um, yeah, absolutely. You know, you you've got a small flavour tonight of three of the casks that we've released in Belgium as part of this project, but um, there are a number of others that the the liquid is just equally as fantastic. Um, so I would urge everyone to, to go and explore these and, and to find them and, and your local retailers and, um, and support and get a bottle for, for Christmas and enjoy it um, because they're, they're really exceptional spirit and it's, it's all exclusive for Belgium it's, and it's great for us to be able to do with, with Sunoco. Um, so thank you to everyone for, for your patience and your support. Um, it, means, it means a lot to us and, and know that we're doing everything that we can to, to make things go as, as quickly as possible and to get you the best whiskey we can possible. Yep, absolutely. Well, from my side as well, thank you very much for participating, everybody. Thank you, uh, Stefan, uh, for allowing me to be the host in these wonderful events. Thank you, Dale, for again accompanying us and um, well delivering all these wonderful uh, stuff to us. Um, hope sure. to see you all um, maybe this weekend at Spirits in the Sky. And definitely ho hope to see you again online or another uh, at another event um, 
um, well, thank you very much uh, to all. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.